Okay, so welcome back, everybody. We're going to jump into our keynote presentation from Dr. Shayla Treadwell. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started now. I do apologize for some of my technical difficulties that I'm having over here, but what a better time to talk about technical difficulties. So um, today uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about building a better system and um, meaning putting humans first at the intersection of psychology and cybersecurity, which is something really, really important at this point in time, especially with everything that's going on in the world. Now, just as a disclaimer, um, I always say this, these are my thoughts and opinions, so uh, if you don't agree with them, don't blame my company, just blame me um, and let me know. I would love to talk about it. So first, let's talk a little bit about who am I? Uh, my name is Dr. Shayla Treadwell. Um, I'm an information security professional, of course. Um, I really specialize in a lot of second line of defense uh, things such as governance, risk compliance, training and awareness, things of that nature. Um, on top of that, something very unique about me is that I am an organizational psychologist. Um, so it, it, it kind of changes the way that I view cybersecurity and the way that I approach things in organizations when we're really starting to look at cyber orgs. Um, along with that, uh, I am very involved in integrated risk management and understanding the strategic components around governance, risk, and compliance. Um, I have a business and strategic marketing background, so I did not start um, with the technology path holistically, more front-end things and digital marketing. Um, I transitioned into InfoSec and absolutely fell in love with it. And at the end of the day, I just want to make a positive impact um, when it comes down to uh, impacting people and things. Uh, I, I want us to do the right thing. That, that's the reason why I'm here today. Now, looking at that, uh, there's something interesting that we have to talk about when it comes down to the threat environment. Uh, if we really look at everything that happened post COVID-19, suddenly we had influxes with ransomware, uh, bring your own device, remote working, uh, increased phishing, and then suddenly we saw this shift when it came down to privacy and the intersection of cybersecurity and privacy. And a lot of small businesses had a need for cybersecurity because our threat actors weren't just targeting big banks or um, different states and cities and things of that nature and critical infrastructure. They were funneling a little bit further down and they were starting to target small businesses. So there's definitely a need in that space. Now, something very fascinating is that when we start to look at the average data breach cost, um, specifically in 2021, we're hovering around that $4.24 million mark. I believe that's what the IDM report said. Now, what's interesting is that is a 10% increase from what we've seen um, in the past. So that's quite significant. Now, most people will say, well, that, does that mean that threat actors are getting smarter or you know, we're not keeping up, that's, that's not necessarily the case. It just deals with a, a volatile environment where we're constantly seeing transformations with technology and improvements. Um, and who we're targeting in these cases looks a little bit different as well. And what's even more fascinating about that number that I told you about the data breaches, when we look at the U.S. cost of data breaches, we're hovering around nine million a breach, and um, Middle East is lagging just a little bit behind us. Um, I believe at eight million when it comes down to data breaches. When it, you look at an aggregate average, so this is just not uh, a problem in one centralized area. This is a global issue, and it's impacting a lot of people. And um, it, it, it's a big, big deal. It's really a big deal. So when we start to look at those changes over time, what I was talking about, uh, in the Verizon data breach report, they started in 2016 and they wanted to look at incidents versus breaches and what was happening in that space. And um, just for definition purposes, when we look at an incident versus, versus a breach, an incident referred to a violation of a policy within an organization or within a specific regulation telling us something that we had to do. Whereas when we move to the definition of breach, 
That was uh, the deliberate exposure of data or information that someone was not supposed to have. And um, uh, it, it, it was something that an unauthorized party did. That's the way that Verizon kind of delineated between the two. But there's two things that I really want to point out. Um, when we start to look at incidents over time, we have social engineering that's hovering towards the middle and denial of services at the top. And now that would usually tell us that the people element is not something that as is, um, I, I guess, pervasive as you would normally see. However, when I look at the breaches, social engineering was just right at the top. So that means that that human element, the human risk element, the, cyber, the psychological element of, of one person being on one end and another end is still at the top. Social engineering is still there and it's still wrecking havoc in this world. And that's something that we really, really need to pay attention to um, because it's been like that forever and a day, um, even from information security days. When we start looking at uh, the, the I, I guess, protection of information that's not even in a digital space, people will find a way to get exactly what they want. So what does that end up happening? People say, show me the money, show me the money. And they end up buying a whole bunch of tools to solve our problems. So we buy tools for tools and we try to solve these issues. And commonly, when we're looking at social engineering, we're typically looking at three different sets of tool sets to help us. We're looking at user testing or social engineering specific tools. We're looking at penetration testing tools and we're looking at vulnerability management tools. Now, when we really talk about user testing and social engineering tools, we're looking at solutions that collect, analyze, and respond to phishing. Um, we're looking at education tools. Um, we're looking at anything that helps people uh, understand um, their role in protecting uh, and securing information assets from that perspective. Um, when we start to swing over to the pen testing, we're really looking at some of the simulated attacks and um, looking at ways that we can test people, processes, and technologies. And when it comes down to pen testing, it does depend on the organization, but there's a ton of tool sets to help us with pen testing. And then we have vulnerability management, which really is about processes or programs designed to manage vulnerabilities. Um, and it really helps when it comes down to looking at risks, more technical risks that we have in an organization. And the tool suite for that is absolutely amazing as well. So we have these wonderful tools to help us. And this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And uh, every organization has them pretty much. But the reality is technology is simply not enough. Uh, it's not enough at all. And a lot of times in order for us to try to mitigate risks and um, to solve problems, you just throw tech at it, you know, throw another tool set at it. But the reality is, is that we need to really start talking about people. Uh, because at the end of the day, technology does what we tell it to do. And humans can't be patched. That, that's not possible. Uh, they make decisions every single day. Um, and that is really the risky area of our organization that sometimes we don't take a, enough time to understand. That's from the adversary all the way down to the people that we have in our organization. <clears throat> so let's start with our adversary, okay? Who are the criminals and what do they want? And what we'll find is that our criminals, um, they vary, they're different. And when you start to get into the psychology, of the adversary, um, you start to learn a little bit more about everybody isn't looking for the same thing. They have different types, different motivations, different strategies. And there's been a lot of research in this area. And when we start to look at the different types of adversaries that we have, um, it, it, it's quite amazing. There, there's a lot of them. We have those individuals who are truly professionals. It's like nine to five, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to go ahead and do what I got to do to get what I got to get. Um, and they work in an office just like you and I. And then we also have those individuals who are old guards. They've been at this thing for a very, very long time and they decided possibly to go to the 
a wonderful light side of the mountain, as I'm going to say. That's where we start to get our ethical hackers and our white hats and things of that nature. They've been around for a while. We have hacktivists. We have digital pirates, students. We see a lot of students and we deal with some phishing emails that it's like, this is obviously phishing. Um, usually it's a student or a novice that's in that space that they really don't know as much. They know how to do a few things here and there, um, but they, they really are learning. They're learning on this journey. Um, of course, insider threats are something that we need to be a little bit more cognizant of um, that traditionally we never had to think about as much. Um, we have cyberpunks. They, it, it's just, they do it because they feel like it and they think it's funny, they think it's fun. Um, we have nation state, state actors. Those are our more persistent individuals. Um, we have our petty thefts that, you know, they're trying to get that credit card number, get what they got to get, get out and go. Um, it's very, very quick. And then we have online sex offenders. They actually fall in this category as well, where they're motivated by some things that are pretty dark to tell the truth. And when we start to look at the strategies of these different types that we've categorized, what we'll find is that they're different. Uh, our novices are not careful enough to cover the tracks. The cyberpunks are focused on guarding public and media attention. Our insiders uh, use confidential information to do things. Our old guards used to be on the good side, and those are our friends. We have professionals. They don't need trails. They're good at what they do. Um, we have hacktivists. Their goal is to really get attention, and um, they love to deface really big public websites and things of that nature. Nation state actors, they're going to keep going no matter what. You can't stop them. They're going to keep persisting, persisting, persisting. And that can be another country to make something like that. Our students, they like to experience, uh, experiment a lot. Our petty thefts, they're um, short term focused, like I said earlier. Digital privates like to steal copyrighted information and then leak it. That's how we get uh, a sample of that album that you know probably shouldn't come out until a little bit later if somebody gets their hands on it. Um, our online sex offenders, they target very vulnerable victims and they do some very, very cruel and compromising things to them. And then we have our crime facilitators who um, offer crime as a service. Like, it, it's a job. It's just like having an MSSP or some kind of service. It's crime as a service. So these different types that we have profiled have strategies in order to impact our organization. And then when we start to think about what motivates them to go ahead and do those things, it's really filtered by curiosity, financial gain, notoriety, um, revenge. Um, it's recreational for them ideology or even sexual impulse and that's very very tied to what we understand about psychology and the way that humans work now the thing that we really have to take into consideration is that individuals are wired to be at a psychological disadvantage when faced with cyberpunk and they often are not presented with sufficient information to make optimal decisions in privacy sensitive situations. And this is all about the fact that this is actually a risk conversation. And when we start to break down risk really is, um, some people say risk is a probability, um, likelihood times threat, or um, risk can also be probability um, times consequence times exposure. And when we start to think about the average person and what they're armed with, they're not armed with the really good information to be able to know how to deal with certain situations, especially with some of those profiles of some of those cyber characters that uh, we just got done talking about. And we're asking them to make these decisions daily. And this has nothing to do with the fact that we have trained them. Yes, plenty of training has been pushed out there with all of our wonderful LMSs and things of that nature. We're getting our compliance checklist done. We did it. Um, and even awareness, like we, we send out all sorts of awareness things. We have banners on emails. We have um, various posters. We give away little uh, fun little squishy doodads and things of that nature. But for some reason, users still are not making the decisions that we want them to make. So the question becomes, um, is it a matter of awareness or are we lacking information to help them make that decision where 
we truly educate them in that space or break it down simply how do we make them care at the end of the day like how do we make someone care and that's a cultural issue within organizations so let's talk a little bit about people the same way we talked about those cyber criminals let's talk about people and what do we know about people? We know um, five basic things from a psychology perspective. We can look at reaction formation, we can look at humanism, behaviorist, our behaviorism, um, a cognitive perspective, and our biological makeup. And when we look at reaction formation, it's really a defense mechanism which imposes emotion. Um, it's the same way that when someone opens up that phishing simulation and they get caught, the first thing they want to do is close everything because they're embarrassed. So when we start to deploy um, a um, learning of sorts immediately after someone falls victim, their reaction is embarrassment and that comes directly from reaction formation. So we're, we're, we're starting to look at the perceived anxiety that people have when faced with difficult situations, especially in the cyber world. Now, when we start to look at humanism, humanism is really a philosophical perspective that is really about the potential of human beings being able to make decisions on their own. It's that intrinsic decision making. Um, and it's the starting point of morality in cyber, I'm sorry, in psychology. And um, this concept is really about the fact that people make decisions internally. And um, being a human has given us a cognitive insight that is greater than most beings that we know of. Um, and with that philosophical in inquiry, we decide what we do, okay? However, um, on the opposite side of the aisle in the psychology world are behaviorists. And when we start to really think about behaviorism, it's this approach to understanding the behavior of people based off of external stimuli um, that help motivate us to do a certain behavior. So if anyone's taking a traditional psychology course, it's just like Pavlov's dog. Um, if you ring the bell, the dog knows that food is there and therefore it can eat. Um, and with a behaviorist approach, it's the belief that if we have this external stimuli, we can get people to do what we want them to do. It's similar to um, if you ever deploy a security awareness campaign and um, you reward people for reporting because that's the behavior that we're seeking, um, people will start to gradually report because they're expecting a reward from you for doing that. So it's not intrinsically their decisions that they're going to go ahead and report that it's the right thing. They report because they've been trained to do that, and they know that a reward is going to happen on the other end. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more and the pros and cons of that, okay? Um, and then we also have this cognitive perspective. And with the cognitive, pers cognitive perspective, it really focuses on how um, people perceive and store information. And it's really about that nature versus nurture aspect. And um, in my studies, we did a lot of research around reflective leadership. And based off of a certain experience you have, experiences you have in life, it predetermines the way that you are going to, to react to things in the future. Therefore, back to our same fishing example, if I um, get caught by a fishing simulation, I immediately feel embarrassed. I'm going to have heightened awareness because cognitively I'm looking out for that because I don't want to feel that way again. So that's the cognitive perspective about all of this stuff with people. And then lastly, there's biological. And biological simply means that uh, we are hardwired to be a certain way from the inception of um, our being and where we begin. So biologically, we're just a certain way. So those are all these psychological approaches and psychology of people and how we process and receive information. And I know you're probably saying, so what does this have to do with cybersecurity? Well, it comes down to this. Criminals can be intrinsically or extrinsically motivated, depending on their motivation, which you saw. However, how can we help mitigate human risk by examining the intersection of psychology and cybersecurity. 
And we just got done talking a little bit about all these foundational aspects of the psychology of uh, people and things that people understand about humans. But how can that help us in the cybersecurity world? Well, I propose that there are four basic ways that we can start to look at this and start shaping the way that we interact with people in cybersecurity in today's living age, especially with the changes in our threat environment and the additional maturity of training and awareness programs, um, just to ensure that we keep organizations safe. Now, the big thing that I want to make sure that I say at this point is that these things that I am proposing it's really not just about the cybersecurity organization at all. It has to be nested deeply into the root of the culture, cultural fabric of the organization in order to work fully. Um, so it, it's not a very easy approach if you have not made those basic cultural changes and implemented your foundational compliance obligations. So what I want to talk about is taking a note from AI and swarm theory. That's something that we see in nature that we apply to technology. Looking at humanistic behaviorism to support training and awareness, which is the space that I fall in. I don't believe people can be humanists or behaviorally separately. I actually think there is an intersection. Looking at dark data principles, um, especially because we have big data and data visualization is a huge thing to help people make decisions. And really digging into uncertainty versus risk. Um, that's something that uh, we probably should talk about a little bit more because they are not the same. So let's take a note from some warm theory. Now what you see over um, here on the screen, those that's a big hive of bees. And I am very afraid of bees. I am, but I love them so much. Trust me, I have plenty of little bee trinkets. Um, but what you see over here is a defense mechanism that bees have to fend off predators before they attack the hive. Now what you see is that all the bees, um, something must have come close to them and they'll all flutter their wings at the same time, uh, causing this pulsing sensation to make the hive look bigger and greater than it is so that whatever's trying to attack it can't. Additionally, um, when we look at specific honeybees, they can warm up their abdomen to up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which actually fends off a lot of predators as well to make sure that even though they're small in stature, if you have that happening with a massive amount of bees, you have a huge heat sensation that's going across the top. Now, you're probably asking, Shayla, what does this have to do with people and cybersecurity? Well, I'll tell you. Um, this is really the foundation of um, some areas of swarm theory. Now, with uh, swarm theory, it's a methodology that uh, is typically used when you're dealing with artificial intelligence, where we have a different way of uh, um, understanding what's happening in different areas of the hive and having one holistic defense mechanism where we can feed information through. If we started to view people the same way that we view technology in this space, we can do some wonderful things. Um, the first example that I can think of is example if we're sending out a phishing simulation. Um, instead of, uh, I want to say, ridiculing one group of people uh, because maybe they're telling each other to watch out for that phishing simulation, we have to view that as a wonderful form of awareness. Because if something's really going down and something's really, you know, happening in the organization, that word of mouth is actually what we kind of want to happen. We want to make sure that everybody knows, don't click on this, don't look at this, let's make sure we get it to the stock, let's go ahead and make sure that we uh, close off whatever area that is in and um, take care of it. So this, this whole holistic um, swarm methodology of making sure that everybody's clapping at the same time because it's one team, one fight, um, is actually a great defense mechanism that many organizations can leverage to build morale in their organization and to ensure that everybody is operating on the same beat. So we can definitely take a note from swarm theory and even the way that we try to programmatically make technology work through AI and ML tool sets and data visualization tool sets. Next, looking at humanistic behaviorism, which is something really um, near and dear to my heart, 
Um, like I said earlier, most psychologists are either humanists or behaviorists. And uh, they don't believe that there is a myth. However, there's a 1970s concept called humanistic behaviorism that talks about the fact that you can have external stimuli to drive people to make decisions, which is not training them to just act, but actually consciously make a decision. And this concept is something that you have probably have seen as we start to see more recent books and uh, methodologies like Nudge, where I'm gradually encouraging someone to make a certain decision. Now, when we look at um, security training and awareness programs, um, it, it's going to be really important for us to nudge our people into making certain decisions, but we actually want them to be equipped and educated enough to make those decisions so that they uh, feel as though they're making them on their own, because that's what we actually want them to do. We want them to do the right thing. This is possible through um, trying to invoke the correct behavior in a different way. So I, I mentioned earlier that you can definitely reward people for doing the things that you want them to do, but instead of rewarding them constantly for just doing that one behavior, make it randomized. So if you do get a phishing email and you desire to report it, which is the behavior that we want you to do, it puts you into a randomized raffle for, so you have an opportunity to win something, but it doesn't stop you from doing the right thing just because you don't get whatever the prize may be. Um, that's one way that you can look at humanistic behaviorism to build awareness programs that um, can really help nudge people to do things um, the way that you may want them to do them. So looking at dark data principles, something that's really interesting about dark, dark data is that um, we live in a world where there's plenty of data around us. Uh, I mean, we get data left and right. This is everywhere. And um, dark data is the data that we're sometimes not always looking at. And this is where I encourage a lot of our um, awareness professionals, risk professionals, to really, really get in touch with your SOC. Get in touch with your operations team. Understand what your intelligence team is doing and what's happening in a threat environment. It's a more holistic approach because there's a ton of data that they're receiving that could um, give you insights as to what's going on in your organization and ways to prepare your people for the future. Um, I believe Splunk said that there's 55% of organizational data that is dark and it's unqualified and untapped. And you can use those things to help you. If you take a moment and look at some of your um, ways that you're deploying some of your awareness programs, getting feedback from your people through different um, uh, uh, reports or different uh, questionnaires and getting direct feedback, you can take that dark data and you can shape and mold your organization and you can draw more insights that you probably wouldn't have drawn before. Um, sticking to the phishing example, uh, if I fish my company and tell them that there's going to be a great sale at a store and you should click on this link to get a coupon and no one clicks on that and then i additionally fish them another time and i say hey um i recognize your great work and here's a free coupon to your favorite restaurant because you're such a great employee and you catch them that helps you understand what your organization cares about and it helps drive morale and it helps you understand the best way to communicate with the organization as you're deploying a program um, to get them to get on board with security awareness. Um, many dark data principles will surprise you because you really don't know uh, what's in there until you start digging and starting to correlate different things. Um, and that's, like I said, where you really have to talk to your incident management team, your intelligence teams, and things of that nature, because you'll start seeing things trending in different directions based off of what you're deploying at what point in time and what message you're communicating to the organization. And then uncertainty versus risk. So risk is really all about potential outcomes and likelihoods that are known to a decision maker. That's the key. It's a risk because it's kind of it's kind of known. Now, uncertainty is the possibilities that are unknown to a decision maker. So there's a ton of uncertainty in our in 
our roles in cybersecurity because things evolve every single day. Now, just because uncertainty versus risk are not the same, that means that the things that you do know, you probably need to start paying attention to. Don't let it just sit there um, because it's actually good information to help you shape and mold um, cybersecurity programs and strategic futures for the organization. Um, this whole concept really comes from the fact that in the cybersecurity world, we call it the VUCA world. It's volatile, uncertainty, rest and resides in there. There's a lot of complex things that are happening and a lot of ambiguity. We really don't know what's coming at us at a lot of times. But it is possible to navigate that world and to understand that with the risks that you can identify, if you have to put in a mitigation for them, they're still going to be risk. You're never going to get it to zero. But people shouldn't be uh, the number one thing in that. I'll put it that way. Um, there's a lot of people um, potentially in your organization. There's a lot of ways that you can get to them and tap on them um, to get their feedback and to understand what's going on in their heads and to push them to care just a little bit more. But that comes from us showing them that we care about them. So it's not just about protecting the company's information. It's about protecting them, their job security, their family. Here goes a set of um, information and tools that you can use in your home, which is really, really cute, especially in remote working, um, that people feel near and dear to simply because they don't feel that you're just looking at the risks of the organization, you're looking at the risks that they face every single day. So when juggling uncertainty and risk, we have to really realize there's some things we're just not going to know, but don't squander the things that we do know. So just looking at some of the key takeaways um, of this talk, we really need to understand there can be synergy between cybersecurity and psychology. Um, that synergy is because there's one person on this end and there's another person on that end when we're dealing with our end users and our adversaries. And understanding the behavioral concepts that govern people's decisions can better help us understand threat actors and end users. Um, it really comes down to what mindset people are in and what motivates them. And if we can leverage that to get the outcome that we're looking for. Now, it's really important for us to consider dark data um, and because that can really help us implement some safeguards in our organization not just from a technical front, but also from a human front and really managing that human risk. And then really clearing up the fear and uncertainty and doubt in an organization to really center the purpose of a program can help not only clarify things for a security program, but also clarify things for people and the organization as a whole. Now, we do know that we, <laughs> there's only so much that we can do However, I do believe that we can do better and we can get that number down and we can continue to take charge and lead for the future um, to make some wonderful things happen. So I do thank you all for your time. Thank you for your flexibility. And I am happy to answer some questions for you now. All right. So it looks like um, we have some questions up here. I, I, I see some of them in the chat. Can you hear me now, Dr. Treadwell? All right, Jamie, I, I see the first question. Um, it's what are some of the effective ways to measure behavioral change in organizations when promoting security awareness. Um, so when it comes down to measuring behavioral change, um, I'm not going to say it's easy. That's the first thing I'm going to say. It's not easy because it's something that we definitely need to do. And in the security awareness world, that's like probably the most intangible thing on the planet at times. But behavioral change can't be measured. Um, the way that I recommend doing this, like I said, you got to get close to your operations team. Um, you want to make sure you get a foundational reading of where your organization is. You want to understand how many incidents are occurring. You want to understand the categorization of those incidents as well. Like, are these just simply accidents that are happening? Is it, 
malicious in any way. So dig a little into what incidents are happening in your company. Start to understand how many actual phishing emails are hitting your organization. That's another thing that I highly recommend people look at because sometimes people focus just on phishing, but let's, let's figure out what's going on. How many are actually coming in and how many are actually getting reported? They're getting through the email gateway. Um, the next thing that I would say is looking at passwords. Um, any type of data that you can get from your IT team as regards to passwords, whether it is um, how many passwords are um, on the top list of most used passwords and um, are people actually changing their password or they just actually adding another number at the end, um, you can get some data around that as well. Once you get some of that baseline information from your ops teams and your IT teams, then go ahead and deploy a campaign of sorts. This campaign um, can be an email, it can be some type of communication. Um, I don't care if you have a campaign where you call people on a phone tree, um, but decide how you deploy and communicate to folks and then go back and look at that information again. Now, once you look at that information, what you can do is correlate some of the things that you did in that campaign with the changes in those behaviors. Um, and that's a great way to uh, measure the behavior of change in your organization and it's a good way to go to your executive leadership and ask for funding and things of that nature to show the maturity of where you are moving in the org. Now when it also comes to baseline measurements that you probably should just have from a risk perspective because I do manage the risk program in my company as well, um, I will say that any type of phishing simulation is one that you need to look at and need to uh, establish what a threshold looks like for your organization, um, as well as uh, looking at the report rate. Now, I do say don't only look at click rate, um, make sure you're looking at the resiliency of your organization, because like I said, the behavior that you want to promote is technically report. You, you want people to report because it only takes one fish, you know what I mean? to make sure people report. So the resiliency rate is the report rate over the click rate and the closer that you are to one or over one, the better your organization is because that means that you're getting to the soft faster. All right, um, I'm gonna go to another question that I've seen here. What role does cybersecurity frameworks play in building mature cyber cultures? Um, cybersecurity frameworks actually play a significant role, I'll say that. Um, and there's plenty of frameworks out there. You have NIST CSF, uh, NIST 800-171. You got ISO 27000, which is more of a standard, but you can use it as a framework as well. You have the critical security framework. Um, I could ramble off a bunch of them. But one thing I will say is pick one. <laughs> pick one to say that's going to be your baseline. That's what you're going to have in your organization. Um, when it comes down to um, implementation, that can be uh, a compliance-ish exercise where you check the box. But the one thing that I will say is when you're implementing your framework, think about your strategic direction as well. Uh, one analogy that I use is that when you start to look at frameworks, frameworks are like building a house, okay? Um, if I'm going to build a house, I have to have all these components. And if I'm building a three-bedroom, two-bath house that's two floors, um, two or three floors, uh, what I'll definitely have that and check the block boxes and say that I did it. However, strategically, is it really smart for me to have both bathrooms on the floor and all the bedrooms on the second floor? Uh, no, it may make a little bit of inconveniences. Now, you can live like that, and you definitely can have everything you need, but is it the most convenient thing? No. And when you are applying frameworks, it is the same. So that's where you start to think about risk appetites and things of that nature in your organization because you have to have a strategic in mind when you're doing that implementation. Um, it, it's similar to when you're thinking about the architecture of your network, implementing zero trust. You don't have to implement zero trust, but those principles are uh, something that really can work to strategically and secure organization more from an authentication perspective. So frameworks play a huge role. Um, however, it's all about the way that you choose to implement them. All right, it looks like we have another question. Um, what does cyber, okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, another question is really about what role um, can cybersecurity awareness professionals play, especially in a post-COVID-19 world where most people are working remote. Um, the biggest thing around that is that you are going to probably have to change your methodologies and that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, a lot of times awareness professionals are used to being in an environment where you can see people and you can touch them and you can talk to them. Um, I even did that a lot in the past when it came down to awareness programs that um, I ran. And in a COVID-19 world where everybody's remote and zoomed out, um, everyone doesn't want to hop on the Zoom anymore. However, there's some cool things that you can do. Um, I've seen organizations deploy little badges so when people complete certain um, cybersecurity awareness um, simulations and things of that nature. So they feel good having that badge. That is something that you can do in a digital world. Um, I've seen organizations nail people small things and nailing things, even if it's just small, can go a long way because it shows people that people are paying attention. Um, gamification actually is really, really huge in this space, but not gamification on an individual basis. It's more gamification in a group setting where you can play a game in one big group. Um, and it kind of promotes um, a lot of team conversation um, to help people uh, stimulate discussion that way, which is very, very nice. And I think the other thing that really works in a digital space is instead of uh, negative repercussions, expressing a little bit more empathy to do um, a little bit more positivity. It's something that people like. So sometimes it means that, you know, you just got to pick up the phone. So that works as well. It looks like I am out of time, but I do want to thank you all for your time. And thank you, Jamie for your flexibility and help with this. No problem. Thank you so much for your presentation. There were a ton of comments in the chat. Everybody was already uh, saying how great it was and how much they appreciated it. So thanks again for your time. So we'll actually take about a 12 minute break this time and then we'll be jumping into the bonus panel with Dr. Treadwell, David Shipley and Bob Gordon. Um, so you'll find that in your agenda after the quick break. And uh, please do use the break time to join the booths or the lounge and chat with people from our team. Thank you.